Well, we are back in Romans chapter 8, as Jim said. It is one of the most important chapters in all the Bible. And as Jim quoted someone, who was that Jim you quoted? Your father. Well, this is, he was right on there. It is um, arguably, as far as the Christian life, chapters 4, 5, chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 of Romans are the most critical when it comes to living the Christian life. And yet, uh, so many people do not have a understanding of it and certainly a proper understanding of it. So today we're, we're back in Romans chapter 8. I came across a, a, this article. It was a United Universal Press, I guess it was, who uh, printed this out oh, a few years ago. And they told about three trained dolphins who escaped their performing pen at a resort in Key, Largo, Florida. Uh, they were discovered several days later in a lagoon off Key Biscayne, some 55 miles in distance. Now, how, the, how they were found was, is what is interesting about all of this. Now, they've been gone three days, 55 miles away. Uh, they were discovered because at, at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then at 2 o'clock that afternoon, and then at 4 o'clock that afternoon, they would come out of the water and perform their, their tricks that they had learned uh, in, their, uh, in the pen there. I guess they were hungry, and so they were performing, and, and another newspaper said the boaters, the pass ones that were passing by, were more than happy to feed them to see them do their tricks. So, Well, though free, these dolphins continue to live and function as though they were not Free. They were still in bondage. Does that sound familiar? Perhaps for believers as well. As one person said, if I'm free in Christ, then why do I feel so boxed in? And unfortunately, too many Christians today feel boxed in, and largely because they haven't learned the real meaning of these chapters. Uh, Paul, in, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, said, It was for freedom that Christ set us free, Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Now, there's a great parallel between Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 5. In fact, all of Galatians for that matter. Um, and, and Paul was, again, as he did in Galatians, what he's doing here in Romans is saying, you're not in bondage. You're no longer under the law, under some legalistic system. Now you have been changed and enabled to live above that. Now, three weeks ago, it's been three weeks since we've been in Romans, uh, we covered verses 4 through 12. Our natural flow would be to go into chapter, uh, not chapter, but verse 13 through 17. However, I feel it is so needful for us, number one, because we've been gone from this passage for three weeks, but I think it's so needful for us to go back and look at verse 4. Because verse 4, next to verse 1, where there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, verse 4 is the key verse. And by the way, keep in mind that, that the chapter break is not inspired of God. Really, chapter 7 or chapter 8 is a continuation of the thought found at the end of chapter 7. So let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Now, Paul begins this chapter by stating that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Now, as usual, the context is critical. And he uses the word therefore. Therefore always points back to that which comes before. Now, some have argued that therefore points back to the rest of the book. I don't think so. I think that if he looks and especially if you study this in the Greek text, you see clearly that verse 1 is a continuation of the last verse of chapter 7 and arguably several verses before that as well. Um, in chapter 6, Paul tells us that that nature, that old nature that dominated us before Christ, and we all have that nature, that power has been broken. His point is, now you have been set free from that old nature, not to live as you please, but to live as God pleases. 
to be pleasing to him. But in chapter 7, he takes us through his own personal struggle. He kind of pulls back the, the curtains of his own soul, and he says, here's what happened to me. Even though I knew that I had been set free from that old nature, I find myself trying to live the law, live by the law in my old nature. When he says, I, I, that which I desire to do, I can't do, and that which I don't want to do, I find myself doing. He wasn't talking about gross immorality. Paul was never an immoral person. He was not talking about falling off the, the wagon, so to speak. No, he's talking about, I'm trying to, even though I know this intellectually, I'm trying to live this in my own flesh. And so he says, he comes to chapter 8, and, and, and by the way, in chapter 7, as he articulates all of this, he basically says, I, the only result of my trying to live in the flesh is I find myself living under self-condemnation. Uh, how many times have I heard people say to me, man, I just feel so bad because I keep doing this. And yes, we need to, have a, a, we need to be sober and perhaps have some remorse about our sin, and especially if it's continuing. But God doesn't want you to live under the canopy of, of suppression uh, caused by this pseudo-guilt. Because Paul said, there is therefore, what? Some condemnation? There's some guilt? Under? No. No condemnation. And so as he opens, we open chapter 8, he's saying, look, there's a new horizon here that I had to come to. I, there's a progression of my sanctification here that I had to come to realize that in my failure, I had been pointed to find out there's, there's something far better. Let me encourage you that, if you, and I, I, I encounter believers all the time, and how many of us do not feel bad when we could, continues to slip on, and fall into do, uh, committing the same sin. But let me encourage you, failure is healthy if that's the case because it points you to the fact where you say, God, I can't do it. And so you've got to have something else for me. I can't live this Christian life. And all I find myself doing is living on the spiritual treadmill. And that's no fun. I'm on the treadmill at my, in my basement four to five nights a week. I want to tell you, it's no fun. I'm on it for 40 minutes at least, sometimes 45. It's no fun. I try to kind of help myself by watching a, something, you know, something on television or listening to a podcast. Uh, but it's no fun. I know I have to do it. I know I need to do it. God doesn't want you on a spiritual treadmill. Well, what happens here is Apostle Paul said, look, there's something better. I come to realize that there's something that God, God has made a provision for us that is far better than trying to gut it out on the spiritual treadmill. So many Christians are living on the spiritual treadmill and, and, and they, there's no joy, there's no happiness. They look like they've been baptized in lemon juice. Uh, they just... But that's all they know, seem, seemingly. Well, Paul has says God has provided two things. When we learn how this, with this divine mechanism, he says there's a divine mechanism that's been planted in us, except it's not a mechanism, it's the Holy Spirit. It is life. And he says the Christian life is not something that is contrived. It's not something that's, it's something that is organic, that comes from within. And God has provided that. In fact, he says he's done two things for us. Number one, he has in, God has infused his power into us. I shared last time, I think we were in Romans 8, uh, that a few weeks ago I woke up on Thursday morning getting ready to go lead the men's Bible study, and I, my head was spinning, and before long I was emptying my insides, and uh, that went on for a long time until finally I said, you know, my son had just gone through this, and he had come to the point of dehydration, 
But once they put that in, he went to the hospital, and as soon as they put that infusion, that drip into him, he started feeling better. And so I remember that. I said, I want to do that too. I want to have that. I, want, I don't like this. Well, God has infused his power, his medicine, his enablement, so that we do not have to live on the spiritual treadmill. And so that's where we are today. So let's begin reading in verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, now this is when you see the word law in the capital, with a capital L here, uh, uppercase, it is talking about the Mosaic law. When you see the word law in the, with the lowercase, it is speaking of the principles of God's word, not to be, confi- not to be mixed up with the Mosaic law. Paul, as I've said before, Paul uses the word law four different ways in the book of Romans. It's amazing what he does. He says, but what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh. It's important that you understand that the word sin there is not talking about the act of sin. It has the, in the Greek text, it has the definite article in front of it, which speaks of the sin. And so he's, in, he's referencing that fallen nature that every person has. For the last two and a half chapters, the Apostle Paul has been pounding the truth that the law cannot bring about transformational change in the life of the believer. Like a mirror, it can point that, the need for change out to all of us. But remember what I, many of you like the illustration of the MRI machine. The MRI machine can show you, it can scan your body and point out if there's anything underneath your skin that needs attention, such as cancer or something like that. But the, the MRI machine cannot, cannot, perform surgery. How many of you have tried to put a CD into a cassette tape player? You can't do that, can you? No. Why? It's not meant to go there, right? When you take God's Word, the truths of God's Word, the commandments of God's words, the principles of God's Word, and you try to live it out in the flesh, in the energy of the flesh, It's like trying to put a CD into a cassette tape player. It doesn't fit. And that's what Paul's trying to bring home in this passage. Now, in verse 4, he says, so let's go back to the last part of verse 3. He condemned the sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law, Mosaic law, might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, Paul goes on here and he's stating that there's a means of activating the Spirit of God in our lives so that when we we are, are obedient to Christ, now watch this, when we are obedient to Christ, we fulfill the requirements of the law. We fulfill the requirements. In this case, Paul was talking about the Mosaic law. So the question that the, the, this passage begs, I guess, is what must I know and do in order to activate God's divine power in my daily Christian life that fulfills the just requirements of the law? Well, look at verse 4 again. Now, some of this is review. I want to remind you, some of it's review. But again, it's important that we review in order to move on into the rest of the chapter here. Uh, so... He says, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now, question. Does verse 4 teach that Christians are enabled to keep all the commandments of God? No. Not at all. The unbeliever can't keep all the commandments of God, that's for sure. But even the believer cannot keep all the law perfectly. He is stressing 
that the person who has come to Christ will have a new relationship with God and God's spirit will reign in his life. He will have a new nature as well. The believer, basically he says the believer has been, his spiritual circuit has been rewired. He's been given a new life. He's been plugged into a new life. Listen, a, a Christian who is truly attempting to walk with God will be sensitive to any revealed expression of God's will, including all of the commandments and principles in the Old Testament. But, and this is a huge B-U-T, but law-keeping will not be his chief concern or motivation. It will not be that which drives him. He will not be, think that the Christian life is made up of how many, of keeping all of the Ten Commandments. Now, we'll get into this more later. No, what was he saying? He was saying, by my being or your being obedient to the known will of God for your life, for my life, through the process of the Holy Spirit enabling me, I am, now get this, I am in the process of fulfilling all the righteous requirements that were found in, or that are found in the law. Alford is a man, is a Greek scholar, who said it this way. He says, those who walk according to the flesh of spirit, they find, the law finds its full accomplishment. Finds all of its full accomplishment. Kenneth Wiest, I mean, you know of him as a Greek scholar, he says, by living according to the Spirit, the aim of God in giving the law will be or it will, it is accomplished in us, namely our sanctification. And I would add that, namely, our desire to obey. Once the Spirit is resident in the believer, the Holy Spirit will lead that believer and guide that believer, giving him an appetite to obey. Now, there's a battle going on, and in, 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 we, we don't deny that, that there's a battle with the old nature. Now, but in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, the believer has that which the unbeliever doesn't have. I mean, what, excuse me, what the Old Testament saint didn't have. He has the Spirit of God. God, has again, has put this divine mechanism in each of us. I want you to hold your place and go to, with me to the Old Testament. We did this uh, a few weeks ago, but I'm going to go back again to Ezekiel chapter 36. And if you want to just read you, you know, over on the, the, on the screen, that's fine as well. And in Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 24, he says, For I will take you from the nations. Now he's speaking to Israel here. What is he talking? What is the context? The context is so important here. The context has to do with Israel in the millennium. When Christ will come back at the end of the tribulation and he will usher in the millennium. Now, he says, I will take you from the nation, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Of course, the land of Palestine. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Now, what is that a picture of? That's a picture of salvation. He's talking about the salvation of of those who will come to Christ, uh, who, who will come to Christ during the tribulation, who will be ushered into the millennium, and those who will come to Christ during the millennium as well. Jewish people at this time. Now, verse 26, Moreover, I will give you a new heart. You get that? I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you, and I re will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. Now, I know we have been speaking and using the term flesh quite often here in, in a, with a bad connotation. In the Old Testament here, it it's, does not have a bad connotation. He's saying, I'm going to give you a heart that's sensitive, that's, that's gentle, you might say. He's talking about here, when he says, I'm, I'm going to put a new, give you a new heart, new spirit, he's talking about the, the transformation and the regeneration of, of the spirit in man. And he's talking to the Jews. We know that Jews will come to Christ, have come to Christ during this age, but m most of them have not. 
And there's going to come, come a time when they will come to Christ during the tribulation, and then those who live through the tribulation, who live at the end of the tribulation, will be ushered into the millennium. And those who are, who are born of them and who trust Christ, they will be given. So here's the point. The point here is that the author is talking about the new covenant that the Jews will have. Now, that new covenant is a delayed on a delayed set on a delay here for the Jews. But for the Gentiles, for each of us, we are under the new covenant now. And, what, and so what he said is going to happen with the Jews has already happened with all of us who have trusted Christ. He has planted a new heart within us. And it said, what does it say? In verse 27, he says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe, what? Say it out loud. Say it. In other words, his word, right? His principles, right? So, God has given us a spirit that enables us to obey his word, God's word. So here's number one. I must accept and believe in the totality of the new covenant. I must accept and believe in the totality of the new covenant. And folks, this is so, so critical. Why do you say that? Because there's a system out there of teaching that keeps saying, yes, you are under the new covenant but you'll never be as righteous as God wants you to be or as he requires. And so the, 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 what, what happens is that so many believers live under this constant guilt. I have a friend who, who are, who's been in that system for years, and they're always talking about how sinful and how evil they are. Now, we're all sinful, but God's word tells us that God has delivered us from that guilt, that shame. There's no condemnation. William MacDonald, in his commentary on the whole Bible, said it this way. Well, I want to, before I read that, I want to go to Matthew chapter 22. What does it mean that the whole, the law, the requirements of the law is fulfilled? What does that mean? Well, let's go to Matthew 22 and then I'll get to MacDonald. Beginning in Matthew 22, verse 35, it says, And one of, the, of, of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, why, which is the great commandment in the law? He's referring to the Mosaic law. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is a great and foremost commandment. Verse 39, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now what did Jesus say? On these two commandments depend some of the law in the prophets. Is that what he said? No, he said all of the law, the whole law and the prophets. Jesus was saying, you get these things right, you get these things right, and you will fulfill the purpose, the righteous requirement of the law. Now, let me quote William MacDonald. He says, as we turn over the control of our lives, to the Holy Spirit, he empowers us to love God and to love our neighbor. That, after all, is what the law requires. You get what he's saying? We're, under, we're in a new dispensation, a new age. Now, in the Old Testament, the, the Old Testament saints, those who believed in the coming Messiah, they had to grind out the Christian life living by the law. But Paul says, no, no, we're, we're, that's changed now. But so, but why, why is he saying that? Because so many were going back living under the law. And many today live under, not the Mosaic law necessarily, but under some law system. I don't know how many times I've heard people say to me over the years, you know, I, I understand, I understood that 
salvation was by grace, but I guess I, I somewhat believed that somehow I had to live out the Christian life on my own. No, the same grace that saved us is the same grace that sustains us, and it's His grace that allows us, allows God, uh, God allows to put His Spirit into each of us. No. I, um, let's see if I can illustrate this principle. One of the things that I, in child rearing, I talk about how to raise children, and uh, nobody's an expert on that for sure. Uh, but one of the things we did is we, we gave our children three principles. We didn't have a bunch of rules. We just gave them three principles, and we said, look, here are the principles that you have to live by. You can't hurt yourself, you can't hurt others, and you can't hurt other people's property. Now, that, that I think was, it worked well for us. Because there's nothing they could do that was disobedient, that was contrary to that which was right, that wouldn't fall into one of those categories. Paul essentially is saying, listen, when you get it right with the Holy Spirit, you're walking in the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, you fulfill all the other requirements. I, I used 1 John 1, 9 a few weeks ago to point out, he says, if we, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from some unrighteousness? All, all. Now, there's a bonus there, right? He says, I, if you confess your known sin... He says, he'll, God will forgive you of all, all of those unknown sins. Why is that? Here's why I think it is. If your heart is right with God and you're trying to live, by him, live for him, and you're trying to be obedient to him in confessing those known sins, God understands that your heart is right. You may not have complete recall. You may not even be sensitive to some of the sins in your life. But God, in his grace, that's the idea. Now, in verse 4, he states that the one who walks according to the flesh cannot fulfill the law. Now, what is the flesh? The flesh, again, is that old nature. I, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, And brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual men. And by the way, the word spiritual is simply in the Greek, spiritly many of those who are characterized by the Spirit of God. He said, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual men who are walking by, according to the Spirit, but as men of the flesh, sarkinos, which means fleshly again, as to infants in Christ, the person, the believer who's walking in the flesh, who continues to live in the flesh, he never grows beyond the state of being an infant in Christ. He said, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able. Why? For you are still fleshly. And for since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? What's he saying? You're living by the flesh. Now, I, I find it an interesting parallel in James chapter Three. In James chapter 3, uh, in verse 14, he says, if, but if you have bitter jealousy, what, what was one of the problems in, in, at Corinth that we just read? They had jealousy, right? And there was strife as a result of that. He says, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, what's selfish ambition? That's people who want their own agenda. It's what I call the, the, the Diotrephes syndrome. You remember Diotrephes? You know who he is? He's mentioned in 3 John. And it says Diotrephes who, Diotrephes who what? Wants to be first among you. Wants to be first among you. Now, he says... Uh, there is disorder in every evil thing, but the wisdom from above is first pure and gentle uh, and uh, full of mercy and good fruit, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is, uh, is uh, righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. But <clears throat> I want you to go back to verse 15. 
he says, talking about this, I skipped it on purpose. He says, this wisdom is talking about bitterness, selfish ambition, so forth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly and natural. What's natural? James just uses a different word. But what's the word natural? What's he talking about? He's talking about the flesh. He's talking about the flesh. If you look in verse, chapter 4, you'll see the, the strife that, uh, that James refers to that's, again, parallels what Paul said in, in uh, 1 Corinthians. There is a nature within us that we have to do battle with that wants to be first. Ray Stedman said it better than I can say it. He said, this old nature with which we are born, which is perverted and twisted so that it never operates as God intended it to, is totally depraved. That does not mean that it cannot do what, uh, what appears to be nice things in the eyes of others and even of ourselves. There is something about the old self, the flesh, which is able to simulate righteousness. In the flesh's pursuit after pseudo-righteousness, even if it succeeds in an outward demonstration of a sweet and lovely nature, it has never achieved anything but self-righteousness. Self-righteousness always demands self-praise. <laughs> See the parallel of what the verses I read before? A longing to be admired, to, be, to win the attention of others, i.e., Selfish ambition. The Apostle Paul says you can, you can accomplish what God desires or demands by gutting it out in the flesh because it's always going to be there. So here's my number two thing here that we need to know. I must die to the flesh. That's a lifelong experience. I must die to the flesh. Now immediately some would say, well, wait a minute. You've already talked about the fact that in Romans 6 we've died to the old nature so what gives? Positionally, in terms of our relationship with Christ from the point of salvation, when Christ died on the cross, he released the power of that old nature. Nonetheless, Paul says in this passage, your body is still dead. Why is it still dead? He's because the old nature is still there. In, in this later on here. Huh. So the dying to the flesh is an ongoing experience. Oftentimes it comes when we try to do it in our own flesh and we fall flat on our face. I've been there many times. I have the t-shirt. But that's what happens. Listen, just being a Christian does not mean that you automatically will begin to look and act and talk and think and react like Jesus Christ. You do not become Christ-like when you become a Christian. I wished. Your human spirit is made alive, no doubt, but you may not act like that way, in that, like Christ, for some time. It depends on whether you are walking or behaving according to the flesh or according to the spirit. You know, the Old Testament gives us great truths, but it also gives us what we call typology, or in some cases we call analogies. There's a great analogy of this, in my view, between the young man Isaac and Ishmael. Remember those two? God says, I'm going to tell Sarah and Abraham, I'm going to give you a, a child, a son, and he's going to be the heir. And what happened? Well, they waited and waited and waited, and Sarah says, uh, uh, we, we got to help God. This is embarrassing. We look like fools, waiting and saying God's going to give us a child. So what does she do? Well, you know the story. In chapter 21 of Genesis, after Isaac was born, Ishmael is making, he's mocking Isaac. And what does Sarah do? Sarah goes to Abraham and says, get rid of him. He's got to go. He cannot be in sharing this, in this airship. And that that bothered Abraham, really kind of gnawed at him. But what did God tell Abraham? She's right. Listen to her. 
God was saying, Ishmael has to go. The whole Christian life, God is saying, the flesh that wants to reign and we give in to has to go. We've got to die to it. Now, the last phrase states, the law is fulfilled by those who walk according to the Spirit. Now, a few things about the word fulfilled first, so, so we give meaning and context for this phrase according to the Spirit. The phrase might be fulfilled is an air subjunctive passive. So let's break that down, okay, in the Greek text. Aorist tense here means to begin with. It's a different one than many times you hear me say the aorist tense means once and for all. It does in many cases, but there are five different types of aorist tense, three main types of aorist tense. And this particular tense, uh, aorist tense, is not a once and for all, but it has the idea of beginning something and continuing it. Very similar to the perfect tense, but not the same. And so he's saying, as you live, as you continue to live in the Spirit, you will continue to fulfill the requirements of the law. You don't have to live under this canopy of guilt and shame. Another thing here is it's a passive voice. The passive voice you've heard me say is, is the subject is acted upon by an outside agent. Many of you who've went through the hermeneutics class, you learned those tenses, I hope, at least. In the passive voice, in this case, he's saying, something. How are, how are you going to walk according to the Spirit? He's, he's saying it's not you that will do this. It is the Spirit who will enable you. That's the intimation of this passage. It is the Spirit that will enable you to walk according to the Spirit. In other words, be obedient to God. I've, I've said it many times. The Christian life is not difficult. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible except that the Spirit of God can live through me and can bring about things through my life and your life that you've never experienced before because it's the Spirit that's doing it. Now, the point here is it is according to the Spirit, not according to our flesh. So what is he talking about? Is he talks about walking according to the Spirit. Well, he's talking about a process or a recipe for activating daily divine power in our lives. When the Apostle Paul uses the word walk, he's attempting to show that this is an ongoing, continuous, habitual process. Doesn't stop. It's not a one-time event. And, Paul, and, he, and he brings this out in another passage, in Ephesians chapter 5. And we're just going to touch on it this morning. But I want to come back and finish this and take us into the next section in Romans chapter 8. But let's just go to Romans, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. In Ephesians chapter 5, 18, it says, and Do not be, get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled by the Spirit. Now, here Paul talks about, basically gives us a recipe for allowing the Spirit of God to be released in our lives, activating the Spirit of God in our lives. The Spirit of God comes and lives in us, no doubt, but this, and, and, this, and we have the Spirit of God, but the Spirit of God doesn't always have all of us. And so Paul is saying you've got to be filled or controlled by the Spirit, Let's just touch on this, and then we're, we're going to move to communion at this time. He says the word be filled is a present tense, which means continuously. It goes with what Paul said in, in Romans. Be continuously, habitually filled by the Spirit. That's the defini- this is the definition here. Keep on being filled. But what does the Apostle Paul have in mind when he says be filled? Is he talking about pouring water into a glass? Well, that's the, in the Greek, classical Greek, that word was used in two different ways. It was used of taking something and pouring, that had water in it, pouring it into a glass, filling it up. 
And so when it speaks of the Spirit of God coming and taking up residence in our lives, that's called the baptism of the Spirit or indwelling of the Spirit, that's the idea. But let me hasten to add, it does not mean, it does not mean that you get some of the Holy Spirit now and you get some of it later. There are those who teach that if you, there's a, if you reach a certain level of spirituality, uh, you will get, you, well, let me back up. When you trust Christ, you'll get some of the Holy Spirit. And then when you reach a certain level of spirituality, you get the remaining of the Holy Spirit. You, you, some call it a second work of grace. Second. That's not so. That's not so. Let me ask you this. When you get married, do you get some of your spouse that day and some of that, your spouse later? No. You get all of your spouse. You see, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. Now, I've had people say to me, I've had people debate me, college students even debated me one time. So, wait, 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 wait. The Spirit, pneuma in the Greek, is in the neuter gender. That's, that's correct. Uh, there are some words that can be used, that can be used in the masculine. And there are some words that can be used in, in the feminine. Some can be used in both. But some words in the neuter gender can't be used in other, they, it doesn't come in, it, in any other form. So my answer to that person was, that's correct. But have you noticed that the pronouns that are used to reference the Holy Spirit are in the what gender? There's no they there, it's he, him. He's a person, the Holy Spirit is a person. Now the second way that it's used is not only speaking of the presence, but when it comes to speak of the power, it was used to speak of, for example, a sailboat and the winds filling the sails, pushing that, that ship, that boat. What did that mean? Well, it meant that you're so filled by the Holy Spirit, you're so controlled or possessed by the Holy Spirit that he has control of you and things come from you that would not normally come from you. Let me, let me illustrate that word just a bit. In John 16, 6, our Lord says, because I have said this, sorrow has filled, what? Your hearts. Now, was he talking, was he saying that sorrow has been poured into your heart? No. No. He was saying that sorrow has so possessed you that it has control of you. That's the meaning of the word in Ephesians 5.